Acts 18. We're just going to take the first 17 and a half verses, and instead of going through it as we go through the text, I'm going to read this whole thing and then come back and go through. All right? So, Acts 18 is where we are. If you found that, then I ask you to bow your head and your hearts. And Father, we just thank you once again for keeping us safe, for keeping us well. Lord, we just ask you to continue to be with and guide those um, who are making tough decisions and on the front lines um, uh, through the COVID deal, through uh, the upheaval and everything else. Lord, we just ask for a healing in our land and our nation. And we ask for your anointing and your presence here today, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now last week in uh, Acts 17, we saw how Paul had been in Athens and how he built a bridge with the local academics, the Stoic philosophers, the Epicurean philosophers, and he played ball in their court and he quoted their, their poets and this, that, and the other in order to be able to build a bridge, in order to be able to evangelize them and talk to them about their worldview. And that's a, that's a major step and a major undertaking, but it isn't the first time that that's been done because actually Jesus did it. It's called in theological circles the great humiliation in that He was humbled and had to become a man. Why did He do this? One of the reasons was in order to, to be able to empathize with us. So we can never say, Jesus, you don't know what it's like. And then I'm going automatically to a song written by Barry Gibb. Anyway, uh, but that was the first time that it really, you know, the major undertaking is that Jesus came down here, became a man, had to deal with the same daily things that we do, all the temptation, all the hate, and everything else that we do in order to be able to empathize with us. And he did that in order to get the gospel across to fulfill God's plan. And that's what Paul was doing, of course, on a much smaller scale. But the, the bridge that Jesus built, of course, is the longest gap to ever be bridged, and I think we need to always remember that. The point is that this step always has to be taken in order to communicate anything, let alone the gospel, because of how, how deeply penetrating it is and because of all the ground it covers. You have to understand that, you know, we've got this... Well, I, want, as I've, I beat this horse all the time. We got this idea of the gospel, say this prayer, and then when you die, you go to heaven, and then you need to straighten up and fly right. All right, now you're saved, act right. That's the kind of, you know, sin management, behavioral management type thing. It goes way deeper than that. Because if it's about a kingdom and an entrance into that kingdom, and then what that king requires and and behavior and, and culture and all that comes out of that. If you go that route, if you build the bridge that way with the gospel, then you have more of a basis to show people why things should change after salvation. And so, um, like I said, I beat this uh, up, up one side and down the other. But when something as large as the gospel of the kingdom is thrown out there, the implications are so much larger than just say this, when you die, you go to heaven. And we'll just muddle through until that happens. Okay? So that's what Paul has been saying. This is what all of his messages have been, his and Peter's, all, all the way through the book of Acts. If you look at Peter's letters, that's what he continues to say. And now we're going to pick up today with Paul as he leaves Athens and then goes west across the Isthmus to Corinth. Hazelnut, we can go ahead and get that map up there maybe. There you go. There's Athens way over here. He's going to go across this isthmus, and on that map, it looks like it's like 100 miles. It's really not. It's really not that far across. It's just the way the map looks. He's going to come all the way across this to Corinth, which is also really has its own little port here. And nowadays, there's a modern canal that cuts across through here. And back in Paul's day, what they did uh, later, after Paul, they're going to try to build a canal through there, but it doesn't work. So what they do during Paul's time is they pull the ships up, drag them overland, and then put them back in the water here or vice versa, keep from having to go all the way around through the Aegean and the Med. So uh, this is a big place, all right? A lot going on there. I've been there. It's a, it's a real neat place to visit. But he has left one world in one sense, in a very real sense, and entered into a different one. 
because though they aren't far apart geographically speaking, culturally they are very far apart. As Athens was the, you know, the intellectual hub of, of, of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and, and the Parthenon, and the Acropolis, and the Areopagus, and all those things we talked about last week, now is in a port city. Lots of sailors. Lots of crime. Lots of prostitution. So much so that if you, could, if you were called a Corinthian girl, you make the connection right there. That's how bad of a place this was. And we're going to see that when Paul makes that journey, this is one reason we're taking it a little bit differently today, we're going to see what it does, what Corinth does to Paul, how it takes his, its toll on him. But we're also going to see how God is always there a few steps ahead of Paul in order to help things work out as they should. So look at verse 1. We're going to read all, like I said, we'll read all the way through and then come back. So this is, once again, after these things is after Paul is departed from Athens. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Now that's funny if you're thinking about what you're reading. We'll get to that in a minute. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, and that's the region of this, that whole peninsula there. This is Macedonia, think of it this way, is northern Greece. And Achaia, just think of it as southern mainland Greece. That's not technically 100% correct, but it'll get you in the neighborhood. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. We're not going to mess with that part today. We'll deal with that next week. But we got a few things going on here that you have to understand some cultural things, and we've actually got a timeline. We can actually put Paul in Corinth within a year or so of, of, of when he was there. How do we know this? Well, we've got this, this, this uh, section is essentially bookended by two, two uh, dates here. First of all, you read that Aquila and Priscilla had left Rome because the Caesar, who was Claudius at the time, decreed that the Jews had to get out of Rome. He banished the Jews. Some stayed, but most of them got out of Dodge um, because of this decree. And why did he do this? Well, Suetonius the historian says he did this because there was an upheaval in riots in Rome due to someone named Crestus. They would say Christus, which sounds like what? Christ. All right. So what, what most scholars believe is you had riots going on between the Jews... And the Christians, whether they be Gentile believers, God-fearers, just like we've seen all the way through Acts, or the Jewish believers, they had started some trouble, 
and Rome doesn't want trouble. So in order to deal with this, what we call shotgun justice, boom, we'll just make a decree, all of y'all. You know what all y'all means? That's like double plural, everybody. Y'all, y'all, get out of town. I don't want to fool with it. So Aquila and Priscilla leave, and then Paul runs up on them. But this decree was in A.D. 49, okay? And then you've got this fellow later mentioned, Gallio. Well, they know exactly when he was uh, the proconsul in Kia. It was the second half of A.D. 51 to early 52. So you got from 49 to 52, right? And you got a couple of years. And we just read that Paul was in Corinth for a year and a half. So we can put him right in there, all right? And so I just want to let you know, if you're one of those who likes timelines and plotting these things out, though you don't get it by just reading over it, if you do a little digging, you can see this. So we're somewhere between A.D. 49 and A.D. 52. And then Paul, um, on his journey, meets this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And they are tent makers. And we tend to think of that as, oh, they're sewing up these cute little things so people can go camping. That's one thing they do, but tent maker just really doesn't describe it. They're leather workers, all right? So they're making tents, they're making tarps, they're in a port city. It's very possible they're working on sails and all of that. Awnings, uh, they can make purses, backpacks, holsters, scabbards, you know, anything, all right? That's what they're doing. And we know that that's Paul's trade, but so far and throughout his journeys, he's never in a place long enough to really get his tools out and do anything with them. But now he meets this couple. They were well-to-do, apparently. They move into Corinth. They have a home. And, and it almost sounds like a lot of scholars believe that they were business partners. But Paul has a place to stay. We've already read that he's going to be there for a year and a half. So now he has the means to support himself for a year and a half and make all the money he needs. He travels a lot. And it wasn't cheap back then, just as it isn't cheap now to travel, and so he's less um, reliant on people giving him money. Now he's able to make some money, and what has happened is he has met and found just who he needs uh, to have with him as he's going to Corinth. Corinth, typical port city, lots of sailors. I've been there. You go look up, there's a mountain there. Think of something the size of Stone Mountain, Kennesaw Mountain, Kennesaw Mountain, what, which is it? Kennesaw Mountain. That you red top, whatever. All right, you see that. Not Everest, but you, you're, the city's down here. And on top of that was a brothel, which was a temple, pagan temple. And also there's a military post on top of the hill right next to the brothel. Go figure. All right. And then at the bottom of the hill where the city is, if you look north to the water, you can see about a bunch of pagan temples. And one of them is raised a little higher than the rest of them. That was the pagan temple to Caesar, all right? Because remember, one of the big deals you've got here is that the Jews have an exemption. They can pray, they have agreed to pray for Caesar, but they won't pray to him. And they finally, and the Caesar said, look, if that'll keep y'all happy and you'll pay your taxes and just be nice, then we'll go with that. And part of the problem the Jews have is with this new Christianity thing and, and Gentiles coming in and just through faith and all this, they're worried about losing their exemption. We saw um, here a couple of weeks ago where Paul was able to keep that exemption, and you're going to see the same thing happen here today. So this is a, this is a rough, vulgar port city, very transient. It is not the learned academia ivory tower uh, that we see in um, Athens. So he's very... Easily, you could say he's just kind of walked out of one door into a totally different place. Then you look at verse 5. It says, When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, that's north, remember, Paul was, and it's, it says here, he was compelled by the Spirit. It was pushed. The, the Greek has the, the, mean, the feeling of just, he's just gung-ho, wide open. He's just hitting it wide open. Once again, he's leading with his chin, just wide open. That's the best way you could translate it, in my opinion. It says compelled, but he's always moved by the Spirit. But here in Corinth, there's an extra oomph behind it. And he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed... Now, I want you to look at this. Because what you see here, 
Paul is now acting like we've never read of him acting before. And this is, kind of, this is part of the hinge on this whole section, this pericope of Scripture. He said, when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads, I'm clean, and from now on, I go to the Gentiles. Now, some people read this and go, oh, Paul never ministers to the Jews ever again. That's bad. Don't think that because just read over the next chapter and he continues to do that. But there have been entire doctrines built off of the Scripture. So what we see is he will again take up with the Jews. He's not even through with them really here. But you see something happen. He's gotten to the point between all the blowback he's getting that he just shakes his clothes, that's just shake the dirt off his feet. He's like, I'm through with y'all. I've washed my hands of you. Your blood's upon your own heads. He's essentially saying, go to Hades. I'm done. I've had enough. We've never seen frustration like this in Paul's life thus far. He has had it. He is done. And he said, I'm not going to deal with y'all anymore, his own people. I'll just deal with the Greeks, the, the, the Gentiles. I'm going to them, and I'm through with you. And you have to see that. You have to put yourself in Paul's shoes to understand what's going on here because we haven't seen that. He's been beaten. He's been, he's, been taken, he's been taken to court. He's been run out of town multiple times and never does he say this. But something here in Corinth is just he's fed up. He has had enough. Not dealing with y'all anymore. And then look at what he does in verse 7. He departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice. Some of your translations might have his first name, Titius Justice. One who worshiped God, so he's a God-fearer, meaning he's a Gentile who is believed, uh, he's active in the synagogue, is believed, what we call a God-fearer. One who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So Paul gets mad, tells them kind of essentially where to go, I'm through with you, walks out the front door and goes right in the house next door. In your face. And he starts teaching in there, right next door. He started a church, you could say, right next door to the synagogue. I'm done with you. When you walk out, turn right or left. Which are, some of your translations may say across the street. Either way, it's real close. All right, because their streets are narrow. So he goes right in and in your face. I'm dealing with them. And you can still, if you're thinking about what you're reading, you can still... Feel the frustration, his blood pressure going, fine, leaving and going right in next door. And, but then what you see is this. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So he moves next door across the street. He sets up there. But what you see, even with all his frustration, even as angry as he is, even having washed his hands, and it's not easy to draw the, the lines over who's believing or what necessarily because you've got so many Greek names here. But, but he's ha still having success. But have you ever been so frustrated that despite the success, you really can't see it? Because the negative aspect is what's hanging over your head. I can be one of those guys very easily. You know, you see the glass is half empty or half full. A lot of times I can see it as half full. When it comes to ministry, it's almost half empty or way more than half empty most of the time. That's the way I see it. That's the way I perceive it. But this has got him so spooled up that despite all the believers he had that, that, that have come on board here, he just can't see it and I'm done with them. You've got to hear that. You've got to feel that. You've got to see that in order to get to what God is doing here. So, on the heels of all of this, look at verse 9. One remembering, angry, he's told him where to get off the boat, goes next door, and even though he's got conver uh, conversions, he's not, he just doesn't see it. And verse 9, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I'm with you. And there's an important one here, I think, as much many beatings as he's taken. For I have many people, oh, excuse me, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. That's always a good thing. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So what, what has happened? Remember, moves into town, 
Aquila and Priscilla, job, money, doing well, blah, blah, blah. Had it with the ministry to the Jews. Y'all get off the boat, goes next door, blah, blah, blah. And then probably that night, we're not told that exact night, God knows what he needs. Sends him a vision. Not as he has before with some man from Macedonia saying, come here and help us. It's the Lord himself comes to him. Why? Why right then? Because he knows he's this close to quitting. He's this close to being done. Even if he doesn't quit and he sticks with the Gentiles, he's cut himself off from the very group of people, the very demographic to which the gospel was to go first, to the Jew first, and then you work your way out. And now he's in a place where culturally they're intermingled. He always goes to the synagogue first. You've got the natural bridge there in the Old Testament, and then he, through the Greeks that have come to believe, and then out in the marketplace, he's, he deals with... Uh, Gentiles in general, and he's now had it. He's fed up with this one group, and he said, and God says, Look. God says, Look, I'm with you. You're not going to take a beating here. I'll protect you. You've got to understand something. There are a lot of people in this city that God foresees, through his foreknowledge, knows are going to believe. Here they are, and I've put you here for a reason. And I know you've had a lot of blowback, but you've got to stay the course. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to make sure you're well taken care of. So he's giving him the encouragement he needs at just the right time. If you don't see the frustration, if, if, the, if the verses that talk about Paul washing his hands of the people, if that doesn't leap off the page, then this just seems like something nice Jesus is doing for him. It's in there for a reason. Luke, as a, a writer, is very selective in when he puts in the book of Acts, and he puts it in there for a purpose. There's a lot of structure in this book, and he's doing this for this specific reason, to let you know that that um, that Paul needed it. Those verses up there earlier where he's fed up, they're in there for a reason, and now this vision is in there for a reason. And look, if you go back a few verses, once again, you're going to see that Paul met up with Aquila and Priscilla. Same trade, something in common, friends. He's got a home. He's got a place to stay. He's now able to take out his tools for the first time in a long time. He's able to... If you work with your hands at all, you know that can be very therapeutic. He's got that going. And, and all of this because God needs him here for a long time. He's going to stay here a year and a half. Do you see the pieces falling in place for what God has to have happen in Corinth for Paul? God got there ahead of him. And he said, all right, let's move this couple in. There's a common bridge right there. Let's move this in. He's going to be fed up, but I'm going to give him some, some success there, and then I'm going to come see him in a vision. And as we go ahead, we're going to see God moving again. Now look at verse 12, keeping all this in mind. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, all right, so remember, that's 51 to 52 A.D. The Jews with one accord, now look at this, in the context of what we've been reading, Reading, with one accord, this is a large group. This isn't a pocket. This is a large group with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. They took him to court. I've been there to that court, and that stone is still there. Somewhere I've got a picture of me leaning over it like I'm handcuffed to it. But I wasn't digging all that stuff up out of my computer. The point is, he's taken to court and probably chained. We don't know that for sure, but that was common. And they, they, this is what they accuse him of. This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And then listen to this. It's very interesting in light of the story. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, <gasps> Gallio interrupts. And he goes right at the Jews. He said, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. And what he's saying is this. If this were a robbery or a break-in, a misdemeanor, a felony, if it was a criminal action, I'll do it. I'll deal with it. But that's not what this is. 
If for a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, pay attention to how this is worded, look to it yourselves, for I don't want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Now, this will slip by in a heartbeat. What is one of the issues, the main issue the Jews have? They will don't want to lose their exemption. When Gallio rules right here, he's, he's essentially saying this. Christianity and Judaism still in the same boat. They've not been separated. Okay, who cares? Well, the exemption is still in place. What does that do? It gives Paul legal room to maneuver. That is one tool taken away from those, the zealous Jews that are coming against him. They no longer have that complaint. They're still seen as one thing. Now, some of the Jews might want it separated, but here's the deal. Even though in Rome, it's not seen this way. That's why they've run them all out of town because they see a distinction at least coming about. And they, the Caesar ran them out of Rome. Hey, right here in Corinth, they haven't got word yet or Gallio just doesn't really care too much. They're still linked together and that gives Paul legal room to maneuver. He doesn't have to worry about anybody losing the exemption. And he says, this is about your own law. This is, this is an internal affair. I have nothing to do with it. Case thrown out of court, essentially. Okay, and he drove them from the judgment seat, verse 17. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, the synagogue and beat him before the judgment seat. Uh, I hate to laugh, but, you know, so they can't get Paul. Paul's protected. The Lord already told him, nobody's going to hurt you. Sosthenes didn't get the same vision in the same memo. All right. So they just take, we can't get Paul. We just beat whoever is closest to him. So they beat this guy. And Gallio just like, whatever. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. So then he goes, Paul still remained a good while. Verse 18. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And then we'll deal with the vow and all that next week. So, y'all are going to freak out right here because I'm going to tell you, I'm at the closing. They're like, wow, what happened to him? We, we expect a full 50 minutes to an hour. But you've got to deal, deal with the text as it sits. All right. So I've dealt with the Jews taking the Paul to court and all that kind of stuff. Paul spent more time in Corinth and wrote more to this church than any other. All right. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, both very lengthy letters. If you read about the church at Corinth, it is the most depressing place, it's the most depressing church of any you're going to read about. If I had been the pastor, I'd have poured gas on it, lit a match, and walked away. These people are crazy, and they'll kill you. You know, those folks in Corinth. It is the most frustrating place. Paul has, and not only does he deal with basic drama, he deals with some strange drama incestuous stuff, all kinds of stuff. These, this is the most worldly church. It's where Paul talks about the gifts of the spirits. You think, ooh, they're the most spiritual because of all this and that. A lot of spiritual stuff going on, a lot of bad spiritual stuff going on. There's a lot of mess going on. This is the most corrupt church, in my humble but correct opinion, in, that we read about in the entire Bible. And this is where he spends a year and a half planning it, setting it up. It's where he writes the, the longest letters to. It is a constantly a bane in his, uh, a, a thorn in his flesh, a bane to his existence. And, it's, and you see that, that even, you know, you read the, the frustration he has when he's trying to set it up on top of that. It's just not the way if you were trying to script it, it would come off. It's just messed up all the way around. But what are we to make of this and what are we to take from it? What is our application? Because so much of you know what we've done is go through there is, is I've given you the history, I've given you the background, hopefully you can see some of what's going on in your head. But what in the world does that have to do with us 21st century Americans? You know, that's what we want to do. We want to read the Bible devotionally, which I would argue is not the best way to read it. And because you were going to lose the context and everything is about you. It's not just about you. 
But here's the point. What are we going to take from it? What can we, in an exegetically sound way, take from it? And, this, and I believe it is this. God knew how rough it was going to be for Paul. He foresaw the frustrations of Paul. And therefore, God sent Aquila and Priscilla as friends and supporters, giving him a home, giving him plenty of work, so that he could support himself for an extended stay. Because despite how bad the city was, God told him, there are a bunch of people here. Despite how you look at it, despite how you want to cast the city, there are some people here who will believe. And I need you to stick it out so that they can be reached. And so Jesus speaks to him in a vision at just the right time, coming right off the heels of his the fit he throws in the synagogue as he walks next door and slams the door and all that kind of stuff, gives him the vision right there telling him that, look, there are a lot of people here. They need you. I need you to do this. And despite all the trouble you have, that you're going to have, I'm with you. I'll be with you in all of this. And this time, Paul wouldn't have to take a beating. That's always a plus. He didn't even have to defend himself in court which he's had to do before. He opens his mouth to do it, and Gallio just cuts it off straight. Now, if we don't take all the little pieces of the mosaic and put them together, you read right through this thing, and you don't really see all the pieces on the chessboard that God is moving to pull this thing off, and that how, mu- and how much He is actually working, not just in and through Paul, but for Paul, for Paul's benefit, for Paul's sanity, to put everybody in in the proper place. And while Corinth was in a rose garden, God was there ahead of Paul, setting the stage. This is perfectly timed with the decree from Claudius to get Aquila and Priscilla out of Rome, and he meets them somewhere on the journey. You see how big that is? If you're on a journey and you're somewhere in a foreign country or whatever by yourself and all of a sudden you meet somebody of the same job, oh, you do this? Yeah, that's what I do. All right, now we built a bridge. And we're starting up a business in here. You do that. Why don't you come in with us? We got a house lined up. You can stay here. You see now he has a, I've told you before, you have to have a base of operations or the local authorities will quickly get rid of you if you're speaking in the marketplace. He has a base of operations. He has a job. He has friends. He has encouragement. Once again, God was there before Paul. God moved people into his life in order to help him and, and help, in order to help God's plan move forward. And for us, you have to see this. And I think if we're frustrated, we often don't see it. When things are going well and you just won the lottery... I don't know of anybody that's, that's happened to in here. But if you, you know, have, oh, look, God is, praise God, look what God is doing. A week later, Eric and did, well, if you weren't a lottery, you just cut a big check, it doesn't matter. But for the rest of us, God did so and so. A week later, the air conditioning is going out. I'm being punished. God's not with me. You know, what shows our Western mindset, because a lot of the world doesn't even have the air when you talk to Western Christians about suffering, how they define suffering, as opposed to people on the other side of the world in the third world, two totally different things. So over here, the skeptic will say, how do you explain if there is a God, how do you explain evil and suffering? And you ask Americans, I don't know, it's just so horrible. You go to someone on the other side of the world who spent a decade in a refugee camp, barely getting by with flies crawling all over them about the evil and suffering, and they see it totally differently. They see God in the midst of the suffering bringing them through. In the West, God is supposed to keep it from us because we're not supposed to have any of that. It's so clean and sanitary and air-conditioned and everything works well in a 401K and retirement and Social Security And then when some little thing happens, ah, we panic. So we see it as God keeping it from us. Whereas the rest of the world, the way the world moved in that day, in the biblical times, they see God moving in the midst of the suffering. Two totally different angles. 
And it totally takes away the skeptic's claim. Because now it's not keeping it from us. It's seeing God move in the middle of it and actually having to accept some of it. That in the middle of it, God is still there. Even though I'm still starving or what have you. It's a totally different way of looking at things. We've so sanitized the Bible and and, and interpreted it in our own way. But God moves like this for us also. We may not always see it, but I want you to think. I want you to look around you and take account of the people God has placed in your life. Especially the ones that just came in at a certain time. You needed them at that time, possibly. Take account of the situations, not just the pleasant ones, but even the bad ones in which God has brought you out of. Because that's what we can see as we're reading it through Acts 18 if we're paying attention to the words and the way everything is working. If not, you're just blowing through life and it's good or it's bad, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You don't see the God, the Creator of all things who is invested in this world and in your life personally, moving some things here and there. And sometimes He brings someone in your life to hold you up and sometimes He brings somebody in there to knock you down to take the rough edges off. Maybe you need a good humbling or something. We all do at some point in time. But he's brought someone in there for that specific purpose. And he's doing this in Paul's life because Paul is so directly in tune with the plan of God. Which I would ask, you know, we would, something we need to ask ourselves, are we? Because throughout the Bible, when you see God moving mountains and moving hell and heaven and earth to move hell and all this to get something done, The common theme is whomever he is working in and through, around, or what have you, is is trying some way, in some capacity, to move the plan of God forward. Now, the question we ask ourselves is how much of, of what I do is invested in that versus how much of it is just so I can have my toys and and be comfortable. And there's nothing wrong with having toys and being comfortable. And not everybody's the Apostle Paul. Not everybody's an evangelist. Not every, Well, everybody should be an evangelist. But not, by, not everybody's a missionary. Not everybody's a pastor. We all have our own world, whether you're a mechanic, a carpenter, a businessman, IT, doctor, lawyer, whatever. It doesn't matter. You have a circle, your circle, your sphere of influence in which you move that God has you there to speak to somebody. You say, well, I'm just a stay-at-home mother. I wouldn't say just a stay-at-home mother. That's got to be the toughest job on earth. You're a stay-at-home mother. I don't really see anybody. Well, you had kids you had to raise all day long, 24-7, eight days a week, and all that kind of stuff. Well, now they're out of the house. Okay, so grab something and run with it. Now you got time. Well, I'm retired now. I don't want to get it out. Well, get out. you got plenty of time. Your wife would probably be glad to get you out of the house. Get out of the house together. But how much of it is invested in moving God's plan along? Because that, throughout the Bible, is when you see God moving the most stuff over the greatest distances. Because that is the common theme from Eden all the way to the end of Revelation, is getting the plan of God out. So when we're moving forward in the Spirit, when we're walking in the Spirit, moving God's plan forward, then we'll see if we are looking how God is moving in our lives. And if you're always trying to read the tea leaves, you're going to be frustrated also because you think you've got it all planned out. Paul has been trying to get to Rome forever. He was trying to get through Galatia, and Jesus told him, no, don't go there. God will change your plans. You've got to adopt Bruce Lee theology at this point, which is when they expand, I contract, and when they contract, I expand, which essentially means you roll with the flow over the punches because you don't know how God is doing it. Sometimes He'll tell you and sometimes He won't. But I can tell you this, every time you see Him telling somebody to do something, never do they get more than like 5% of the plan. Abraham, go. What else? Just go. When you get there, I'll tell you the rest. Paul, go. How am I going to do this? I don't know. We'll we'll tell you. We'll figure it. I'll let you know on the way. You've got to take the first step. And so what you see here is 
Paul takes a step of these missionary journeys, but God is ahead of him all the way, giving him all the support he needs, whether it's legal protection, supernatural protection, friends, encouragement, support, a vision, or whatever. Financially, he's taking care of them in order to do this. And God works the same way with us today. We will get that encouraging word from a friend or acquaintance or even from the Lord Himself. But I still believe in dreams and visions and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you're having them all the time, you might need some help. But the point is, God's still moving. And we will get that encouraging word. We're never promised a rose garden, but we are promised the help, the encouragement, and whatever it is we need to finish the journey. That's what you've got to take out of Paul's frustration and all that you see happening off of that. Would you bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, all of us to some varying degrees in our own personal context have been frustrated, will be frustrated, probably frustrated right now for some reason. Something's going on. We all know, Lord, that throughout life things go good for a while and then you get punched in the gut with something. That's just the way it is. That's part of life is dealing with problems. If people didn't have problems, none of us would have a job because we all work in fields where we have to solve someone else's problem. That's just the way the world works. But Father, to the believer, to the person invested who knows their place in you, who walks obediently, who seeks your heart and your face, Lord God, then we see that there are things there. Sometimes they're supernatural and major and it just jumps off the page. Sometimes not so much. But what we see consistently, Lord, is you moving in the shadows, sometimes up front, moving people, places, political situations, laws, whatever. Lord, you are moving things on the chessboard in order to get things done. As we get closer and closer to your coming and to your restoration of all things, Lord, you're moving people. And even though we can't always figure it out, even the situations in which we see today, the civil strife, the COVID-19, all of these play into your plan somehow. I can't say how. All I know is we keep doing what we've been called to do. And we look for the turns and the forks in the road that you put in front of us and we seek your face, Lord. And somehow through all of that, when we're obedient, Lord, the church shines and it grows. People are saved. People are helped. The vulnerable are, are less vulnerable. Things get done. And people see a glimpse of heaven on this side of eternity. And that's what we're supposed to do here. So, Father, just let us stew on this story this week. And I just pray, if nothing else, the therapeutic value, if we could just for a few days look at the people, the situations, the places you bring into our paths and across our paths, the people you put before us, Lord, that keep us moving forward. Lord, we thank God for them. We thank God for you and all that you do. And, Lord, I just pray that we be able to see them more and thereby be able to thank you more. And that leads to praying more, which just keeps feeding on itself. So we thank you, Lord God, for what you've shown us with the Apostle Paul. And I pray, Lord God, that we see what you're doing in each of our lives today. Lord, please keep everyone safe and healthy so we're able to come back next week, Father. And we just thank you for moving in our lives and for your grace and for your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. It's in his name I pray. Amen.